tell us how to add native shade plants to your um, garden. So Roy, A-N-O-W, not N-O, so it's not, there is no maintenance. It's, you need to know how to maintain your plants. Um, so Roy believes that gardens should be thoughtful, ecologically directed, emotionally outreaching, and yet very personal. So we're delighted to have him with us today. Um, and I will let Roy get started. I will stop sharing. Thank you, Roy, for being here. Well, thank you. That's very cool. So I think, uh, connect, can you see the screen? Am I okay? No, you should be able to share. What should I push? Um, down at the bottom of your screen, share screen. Okay. So and how those plants are to grow into each other from use to maturity. So it's simply not putting something in that you want. It's putting something in based on how the plants will, will grow from youth to maturity in the system of planting you're going to use and the relationships you're creating. And that's where people get confused. They, they put plants in because they want this plant or want that plant or they want this plant to do that. There's not a plant on earth that's ever going to do what you want. That's not going to ever happen. So what you have to do is be very impersonal with the plants and not go after what you want, but you have to listen to who the plants are, where they've come from and what they want to share with you so you can understand who they are, who they've grown with and how they've lived on earth. And the other thing that plants require from you, they require your patience. They don't want you to be in a hurry. If you're in a hurry, they cannot respond to what you want to be in a hurry. So patience, understanding and coming to know plants is a solution to putting something in the earth healthy. And diversity is the key to success. So I'm not gonna show you too much diversity. I'm just gonna show you the, the, the ground layer of where all plants have lived socially in community in the shade. And this is our typical planting. We've homogenized the United States. We've taken every place in the United States and turned it into one place. So we've taken plants that have lived socially on earth their whole lives in tight relationships, like the poor daily. No matter how much you love native plants, you can't take the one end of love you have for a native plant. You cannot hate a daylily. Daylilies never agreed to leave the southern part of Mongolia to go to the United States to be planted on every gas station, every Walmart, and every backyard. That was never their choice as a future. And not one daylily ever decided to live separated by wood by three to four feet. There's no on earth wood has fallen from the sky three to four inches a year and surrounded herbaceous plants. Plants have no genetic knowledge how to live in accumulated wood. And look at these prairie drop seed. If you look at sparabas, what, what, there's nothing happy about this planting. These young, these young sparablas thought at some point when they were in the back of someone's truck, we're going somewhere where we can be put in the earth and we can live socially and happily with all the other plants we've dreamed of living with. And they end up in a parking lot, four feet from each other, separated by wood, and the wood keeps coming every year. The contractor shows up, puts another three inches of wood around them, and nobody cares. None of you care about this. This doesn't look good to anybody. But people don't know it doesn't look good because this is what we do everywhere. We've never questioned why do we use wood to use as a mulch? And wood is put down so carelessly and inhibits the growing points. This poor geranium has to push its way through wood, the contractors just threw down simply because they had to bring the truck back empty. And every year, Americans put volumes and volumes and volumes of wood around the plants, changing the chemistry of the soil, changing the bacteria and fungus that live in the soil, breaking down wood, oxidizing wood every year. That's like if I fed you sprinkle, uh, powdered, powdered frosted donuts with those sprinkles on, and that's all you can eat for the rest of your life. You're not going to be healthy. Wood has no place in our landscapes. It might be good to establish trees for a year or two, but the, what we want to use is a living mulch. And let every plant that ever occurred on earth is self-mulching. A plant has never lived on earth that was, that, was, that was mulched by the Native Americans that lived there. The Native Americans didn't go out in the prairies, wood shipping the prairies every spring. The Native Americans didn't take the Native American blowers when in the Native the, into the woodlands, blowing the leaves and taking them to the Native American landfill. Every plant lived in a beautiful system of living 
just like you live in a beautiful community when you live in Oak Park or Berlin or whatever your community is, you've got churches and schools and neighbors and streets and you've got everything you want to be happy, all relating to each other. That's what every plant on earth has always had. And look at how the wood, oxid or the wood before it oxidizes turns to fiberboard. Look at this poor hospital pushing its way through this wood. How do you imagine air circulates in, and out of the soil into the air and back in the air into this? It doesn't. How do you think water, when it rains a quarter inch or a half inch, gets into the earth? It doesn't because the accumulated wood turns into fiberboard. And what, once that poor hosta pushes its way through the, the wood, guess what happens? The landscaper shows up with another four inches of wood to put around the plant. And land slowly dies because it can't push its new growth through the through the through the wood that's been compacted and uh, becomes fiberboard. So I just wanted to start with this because I, I think it's important that we understand what plants are saying to us. Here's how we've lived: we've self mulched ourselves our whole lives. We live socially together in tight communities. And then when I look at prairies, I, this is a prairie that was at Ball Seed, and, I and Anna Ball, she said, Roy, can you come out here and help me learn to love my prairie? And I went out there, I said, Anna, you don't have to love that. That's not a prairie. She goes, what do you mean? I go, that's five native species of, of messic prairie plants living in a big open field. That's not a prairie. I call this a commercial prairie. It was seeded here, and what it became was dominant by New England aster, big blue stem Indian grass, and that's about it. The solid ego showed up on the feathers of birds. Aster pilosa showed up because it always does in disturbed soil. But this has, this has no relationship to what a, a prairie has almost 12 to 18 species, maybe 22 species per square meter. So this isn't really a prairie. It's just five native thugs living happily together in an open field. And really, if you think about insect populations, it's not going to attract the insect population people would believe would show up. It'll get all the generalists that would show up on a vacant lot, maybe a little higher percentage. So when you're putting a prairie and you'll get constantly seeding year after year after year after year, and you don't start with the big thugs and bullies, you don't put in Indian grass, you don't put in big blue stem, you don't put in panicums, you start with the short bunch grasses. And the short bunch grasses will let light through to touch the earth so you can keep seeding and seeding into those grasses and you can keep adding diversity to the community. And there's very few people that I know do that. Tom Vanderpool did this in Barrington for 31 years. He knew how to do this. He never stopped seeding the conservancy in Barrington. Um, Neil Diebold does this in Prairie Nursery. He's very good at continuous seeding, adding diversity. And now Jens Jensen does this in Madison. That's Jens Jensen's great grandson. He has, a, he has an emotional, passionate way of putting prairies together so it, they're all about diversity. So I just wanted to point this out to you that it, it's, it's not, and the one good thing is that the deep penetrating roots of these grasses do a tremendous job at enhancing and improving the soil, even though it's only four or five species. So it does break up and create good organic matter in the soil, not as much diversity because it's only three or four different root systems, but it is wonderful as far as moisture moving into the earth to have those deep penetrating roots. But, it, but it's, not, it's not really a prairie. I call it a commercial prairie because it's put in commercially and seeded one time with maybe 150 species in the seed mix and you get six or seven that show up because they're basically native thugs and bullies that take over the whole site. Here's, here's our model. This is, this is kind of what we want to see, added diversity. And, and again, I know we're talking I'm going to get into the shade, but this is what we look for. This was seeded. This is Tom Vanderpool. Look at the difference between this and this. Continuous adding of diversity through seeding, and it never stops. And then planting of, of diversity. This is a, a perennial garden, but look at the beautiful echinaceas mixed together. And you say, well, what makes that look so beautiful? It's all about composition. When you're planting a garden using all native plants, you just don't throw them in willy-nilly and it'll look good because they're all natives. That's like if you had... If you just pound a piano, you're actually playing notes. If you're pounding the keys of piano, those are all notes you're hitting. And they have names, B sharp, F flat, but that's not music. It's all about composition. So when you're putting a garden in, if you're using plugs, think about the composition. Think about being the artist in the garden, the Rembrandt, the, 
the Monet, how you put the plants together so they'll grow from youth to mature into beautiful patterns. And once you, once you create beautiful composition with native plants, all your neighbors will say, how did you do that? How did you create something so beautiful? And it's about placement and relationships with plants creating good composition. And these are some of the gardens we, we've done with uh, two and a half inch containers, uh, native plantings here in Lake Geneva, boulevards with native plants. But again, with good composition, people drive by here and they actually want this to happen at their home. We love what you did there. Can you do this at our house? And it took, it took, it took passionate people. So I, went, I put Ray Schulenberg in here because when I met Ray Schulenberg in 1979, I, I, he, he was amazing to me. I went to the Schulenberg, crying. I couldn't believe something that beautiful wasn't everywhere. So um, I think it is, it's important to know who, who got us to where we're at. And he was one of the key peoples with, with Floyd Swink. And I'll show you a bit about Jerry Wilhelm, how important his contributions have been. And this is the Schulenberg Prairie, the diversity that Ray put into that site and continue to put into what the Arboretum's continuing to do and following Ray's footsteps to, to, to maximize diversity. The Silphiums, it's just a, it's, it's a stunning place. I think it has more diversity than any recreated prairie in the Midwest. They've got six to eight to 12 species per square meter. And community, this is the group in Fontana, Wisconsin. It, this isn't put in by a bunch of people hired with trucks and, you know, a big expensive trucks. This is, you see Tom Vanderpool there in the center. He's, he's the prairie whisperer. He's showing all these people where to put their seeds. He lines them up. He mixes all the seed differently in buckets. So as they're walking along, they're dispersing the seed in areas that are weak for certain plants to be put in there. He, he had this whole process thought out. And there are prairie whispers like that. I mentioned Neil Dybul and Jens Jensen and, and uh, Madison. And then the community took care of this. The, the garden club in Fontana, they went out with their Dutch push pull hose. They were hoeing through the the, the perennials and they would add more plugs. And it was just, it was great because it was community in action. And I, I was so moved by the way the community had uh, moved into this prairie project and they did a great job and they still are, they're still continuing. And this year they're getting high school groups involved. So when you look at shade gardens, we start with shade. We start with whatever amount of light energy can get through the trees and shrubs that you have. And that's something you look at first. What, what type of light energy do you have coming through your tree canopy and at what stage and when's this leaf out period? Who leaves out the earliest? When, when is the latest trees or shrubs to leaf out? So you look at the quality of shade. This is early spring. This would probably have been a week ago here by us. Even now it's been pretty cold. This is what our woodland areas look like. One area on Lake Geneva. And look at the layer of sedges that are there. This is a remnant area. Not many are left on Lake Geneva, but this is one that, that's in private ownership. But look at the sedges are the skin of the earth. They cover the ground, they come up everywhere. The basic, the most dominant one in this area is Carex Pennsylvanica. And there's a, all other groups, Carex Blanda, Carex uh, um, um, Rosia, Carex Radiata, uh, depending on the ground, uh, moisture changes in soil as the ground gets lower from higher. But, you, but it's just an example, the sedges, this is the primary planting of a woodland garden. It's, you don't start with the entertainment, you don't put in the columbines and the trilliums and the may apples. You start with the sedges. And what will the sedges contribute? Basically, the sedges contribute to, to one, they send out a deep, deep root system that allows moisture and water to get to penetrate into the earth, not to run off. <clears throat> and they also contribute with the living and dying of their roots. They bring a great deal of organic matter back into the soil. So they create a healthy soil. The other thing they do is they cut the foot candles of light down to shade off the ground to keep keep weed seeds like garlic mustard and other things, a hen bit and chickweed from germinating. So once you cut the foot candles of light on, the quickest way to do that by covering the earth is have sedges in there. This was a sloping hillside it did going down to Lake Michigan. There was 120 steps to the lake. I knew that because every time, I, you couldn't stand up to plant this either. But once, once I got 
once we got this in, it was year 2002, I think, the sedges knitted together, covered the ground and minimized runoff. And then after the sedges were in, we started incorporating uh, more diverse plantings with the columbines, uh, <coughs> a lot of ferns. They put a lot of ferns in this one. She loved the texture of ferns. And these are sedge matrixes we're doing now with uh, perennial meadows. We're doing perennial meadows going from sun to shade, native and non-native plants living happily together. And then we put a sedge matrix in and a sedge ma matrix, again, you see how it covers the earth? That's Carex pennsylvanica, Carex Um, and, and each matrix is dependent on soil conditions. This is a wet area. So this, act, this area is actually dominated by Carex proboides because of the soil moisture. And I want to show you something that we're doing based with uh, from Jerry Wilhelm. I said, Jerry, if there's something cool you could do, what would you do? He said, Roy, I'd love to take a small oak tree, put a small oak tree in, and then at the drip line of the oak tree, plant it with sedges. And that way the tree will grow and never know life without the plants it appeared on earth with. I thought, is that cool? So we've been doing this here in Fontana, we're, we're, we're started, but we're, we're, we're gonna work with school groups, young children. And here's an example Jerry sent me of one of his neighbors. You can see the lawn, it, the tree is in the lawn, but where the drip line of the tree is, as the drip line gets bigger, he, he expands the sedge garden. I thought, isn't that cool? So you're not in any rush. You're waiting as the tree gets bigger, you edge it out to the drip line of the tree and you add more sedges. And you can see the mertensia, the maples, the carex, the woodland phlox. And it, there's no hurry. It just keep moving it forward as long as the tree, it was when the tree keeps, the tree canopy keeps growing. And here's the uh, dodecathian, the, uh, the, the maples, the woodland phlox. And I thought, what a cool idea. I, I think it, it, so we, again, we've been practicing this in Fontana. We were in one park in the, in the west end of the lake. And we have school children, you know, we're gonna add another two feet this year to the garden. They'll put in maybe 30, 40 carrots, Pennsylvanica, and then we can start adding maybe two or three May apples to the mix as the trees get bigger. <laughs> but these are things you can do at home, starting small with your young oak trees or, and just put a sedge, a sedge around the drip line of all your trees. And as the trees mature, you just make the drip line bigger. Look how beautiful that is. I, I really enjoyed this conversation and I and that, the thing was taking action on it too. It wasn't, well, that's a good idea, Jerry. See you later, hope it all works out for you. It was, no, let's do something about this. We, again, we started with, uh, with the West End of Fontana, but you can see how beautiful it can be. And just think if everybody in your community took their own little oak tree or even an existing oak tree and just went out to the drip line and started putting sedges in. And we actually did a planting on at Belfort, I think in Oak Park, uh, Belfort and I can't, Thomas, the, the, the area between the curb and the street or the sidewalk, we planted everything in sedges. And you just mow once a year. So you cut it down in, in the fall or in the spring, depending on, uh, usually we do it in the spring. And then you just let the sedges come up. And you, so you reduce your mowing from 27 times a year to once a year. And you have a beautiful texture of sedges. And again, once the sedges are in, you can keep adding anything you want to it. It doesn't have to be uh, go to Kath and you put blue hostas through it if you want. You can put strawberries through it, a native strawberry and have a little strawberry, but you have to be prepared to share your strawberries with the squirrels because they'll take some of your strawberries away. But it's an option. It's a really a, a thoughtful thing to do and it saves labor. You know, if you want to look at how you, how you reduce your, your mowing time and using gas and it just, uh, it, to me, it's just a smart thing to do. And then he, this guy, the homeowner, Jerry, he would burn his little area. I don't know if you can burn it in Oak Park, but he, he would burn his little woodland area off. Just have a little fire around the tree. So what he's creating is a wonderful community, an, an oak community. And that oak tree will never know life without the plants it's always lived with on earth. And I thought that was so touching. Look at it, there's his little fire going, burning his little woodland community, and it keeps getting bigger. And again, it's not, it's, it all starts with one person. It's not like, you know, you, this, this will never catch on, Roy. No, just one person does it, then two people do it, then six people do it. 
Then you do it with your family of something to share with your kids, the grandma, the grandpa. It becomes a community project. And then after all of a sudden, you've changed the community and you've changed it through self-discovery. Don't tell people what to do. Nobody likes to be told what to do. We know that. That's just our culture. But when you, when you find self-discovery, you change. As soon as you discover something on our own, we, we change because it all just makes sense to us. So we're looking at using sedges as a living mulch, combining practicality with style. And this is the garden I, I did at the Shedd Aquarium in the Oceanarium size. So we just planted sedges around all the shrubs. So the, the, the garden at the shed never gets mulch. It lives, it lives in its own stem fall and leaf fall. We mow it once a year. And, and, and then we, and the, the, the new director there, she keeps adding more diversity when she, when she can afford it, it's within their budget. And then when she has time for it, so it's, there's no rush to increase the diversity, but it's a consistency of doing. If you put 10 things in or a thousand things in, it's keeping the consistency and momentum of, of doing a life. And you look at spacing. This is a, a Carex albicans. So we space them about eight to 10 inches apart. And our goal is to have them cover the earth. This is the second year. So we've cut the light penetration down almost by 75 to 80%. So that means we've got the weeding time down by 75 to 80% by reducing the light as quickly as we can in the spring. And this is just the second year. By the third year, the, the ground's basically covered by sedge foliage by, uh, you know, it'll be April, late April, depending on the weather, probably late April or May this year. At least up here, it's been very, very cold. And, and last week, we had three and a half inches of snow here in Lake Geneva. That's more snow than we had the whole month of December. <laughs> So it's kind of interesting, uh, the adaptability we have to go through with our, our climate. Uh, and then you take your, your small sedge community. You have your, your Carex, and you can start, start out with, uh, if you have a dry side, average dry, you can use Carex Pennsylvanica, Carex Albicans. And there's a, a book you can get. And I have the book sitting over here. It's, it's, it's the floor of the Chicago region by Jerry Will. I'm, a lot of you probably have this already. But if you just look up Carrick's Albicans or Carrick's Pennsylvanica, it, it shares with you, Jerry shares with you, the plants that live within the carrot that sedge community. So it's, a, it's very helpful in letting you discover what plant can mingle into that sedge community. It's a floor of the Chicago region. Now it does weigh 10 pounds. So you don't want to haul that around the house or keep it in the front seat of your car. It, it has a substantial weight, but it's, there's, no, there's no better book to find out how to put communities together in, the, in, in this particular area. And I just put them in little th uh, two and a half inch pots. So we have the wild geranium, we have wild ginger, uh, tenidia, integrifolia, and just create a community with the sedges first as the matrix. I get the sedge, the sedges established first. I put nothing in, I put the sedges in first. And after I have the matrix of carrots done, I don't use just one, we'll probably have three or four different kinds in a dry area or an average area, Pennsylvania, Carex Albicans, Carex James Eye, and then some Carex uh, um, granularis, a little, a little bit of blue color. But the, the practical influence of Carex, and I'll read these, is creating a healthier habitat for woody plants. They make every woody plant healthier because of the living and dying of their roots the organic matter content, the penetration of moisture into the air. It promotes continued enhancement of the planting through time. The pl everything gets healthier. As time goes by, the, the sedges get thicker. They don't crowd out the plants that come through them. because they're, they're social beings. They've all lived socially as, as long as they've been on earth. Reduces wood mulch. You don't need wood mulch anymore. You don't need any mulch. You just mow it and let the plants live in their own stem and leaf fall creates an interconnected plant communities that contribute to their own well-being. You're creating plant communities. You can see at the bottom of this photo, I have Carex plantaginia with the uh, um, geranium, uh, Carex albicans and geranium macrorhizum, which is a perennial. It's a perennial out of Europe, but I, I use it as a ground cover. I, I love the plant because it covers the ground nicely and it respects its space. It's not a thug or bully. It doesn't reseed around. So it's an excellent, excellent plant. And usually that's why I look at plants that respect their space. I don't start with thugs or bullies. They're gonna give me something to do. 
I don't need something to do. I've got plenty to do when I put in plants that respect their space. And I can define my time. And that's what I put in my book, The No Maintenance Perennial Garden. Because when you, when you put plants in, you're creating the time it takes to care and love them. So when you create your plant associates based on what their needs will be, you can predetermine how much time you'll be needed to spend gardening. And it reduces confusion about the needs and wants of plants as, as they become a healthy community. So once a community knits together, you're not confused by who they are and what they're going to do anymore. The sedge provide a healthy ground layer and the plants come up through the sedges based on where you've placed them and how you've allowed them to develop in the relationships and the plants they're living with. So this is a new garden that we, we've done at a home here in Geneva. And simply at this house, this was a person who just couldn't get grass to grow anymore. And they didn't know what else to do because that's all they could think of growing on a large scale like this was grass or vinca or pachysandra. They didn't want vinca, they didn't want pachysandra. So again, we put in uh, sedges. And the thing we can do is I can compete cost-wise with pachysandra. So it's not a, if people aren't quite ready to understand sedges, they do understand the financial aspect of covering a large layer. So we, we planted the sedges and they all started to fill in beautifully. And you can see the claytonia and that was all there. The claytonia were there, the, the uh, erythronium were all there. Everything was there just waiting to be put in a position to succeed with a community of carex. And they flourished because the guy mowing the lawn wasn't running over them with the mower every week. So they actually could live with mowing. Their foliage would be there, collect like they go dormant. But the owner never saw these. He's never seen spring beauties bloom there. I said, you've had them your whole life. I didn't put them in. They've always been there. So it, it was self-discovery for him. And the nice thing is he shared that with other neighbors uh, down the lake. So everybody close to him was seeing the opportunities of sedges in action, working with the plants that were existing on site. So you can see in this photo how we, we've covered a lot of ground, but yet we've, we've enhanced the area dramatically and we reduced labor because now the guy, the mowing company doesn't come out there just scattering dust in the air by riding a mower once a week over, over what existing lawn there was there. And then uh, stewardship wise, I think we're out there maybe four times a year doing some hoeing to keep uh, any competition out. Some of the turf grass that's left, we hoe that out. And this was three years ago. Now, the, if you see the garden now, it's completely knit together. You see how tightly it's knit together. And you get in this particular picture, there's tinidia, integrifolia, yellow pimpernel. We have pacara in the back. Pacara uh, abelveda is in the back. And that blooms very early. And you see the pacara on this, uh, this tree, this tree, I think uh, it's not an oak. I, not, it might be an oak, a black oak. But we just put a little plug in it, two and a half, and we don't disturb the soil deeply at all. But when we put the packer in, the packer will spread. See how it's going up the trunk of the tree? It's not inhibiting the tree at all either. It's providing actually benefit to the tree by, by an extensive root system. And it loves drought because this is the way it's always lived. And it's living with the plants it's always lived with. And we've got it interplanted with sedges. So what the packer does, it seeks out open spots and inhibits weed development too. And this is Thelictrum dioecum. These are some, we don't mix a lot of plants in with the carex initially. We just mix in this Thelictrum dioecum. It's a short metal root. And it has very textural foliage, beautiful foliage. The flowers are kind of a greenish color. And it only gets around 24 inches tall. And it, it, it comes through the carex community. So it's never outcompeted by the sedges. It pushes its way right through the foliage. And then we add ferns. These are... Uh, I think interrupted fern, we get them from a nursery. Uh, they're done through tissue culture. So we get a lot of ferns from tissue culture, uh, grow them. It takes a few years to grow them. They're very small when we get them. And then we pot them up into small pots and move them into gallons or quarts. But we don't put the ferns in again for the, probably the second or third year. Once the sedges are established, we'll incorporate ferns within the planting to enhance the, the texture of the garden. <coughs> And this is a Carrick spring yellow with uh, it's hosta halcyon, but it's a, a native delphinium, delphinium tricorn. And delphinium tricorn is a spring ephemeral. It flowers in May and then goes 
uh, dormant going into June, but it's a beautiful purple. So imagine if you're if you're being Monet in the garden, you could take that uh, fitting tricorn and just drift it as far as you want. Now, but the other the other consideration is availability. All right, right now I'm out. I, I used more than I should have, and I'm out. We we can grow this from seed. It takes three years to produce a, a plant that may bloom from seed. Plus, I have to collect it quickly too, so it's it's a collecting ability. So this year I'm hoping to stock up on it because nobody, I don't really know many people that sell it besides me because it it's it's too much effort to grow it. And I got used to putting modest effort into being a, a grower when I ran the natural garden from because I got there in 78 to 91. So I and I met again people like Ray Schulenberg, Jerry Wilhelm, and Bob Horlock was a tremendous friend. I went to walking prairies with him. He was just wonderful. But it, it taught me patience. If I'm going to grow something, I can't just grow what grows quickly and sell it quickly. And I still try to, that's still a way I like to be up here at, at Northwind. And you can see the different textures and sedges that the Pennsylvanica late in the year turns brown, the foliage will be a brown green. And the, but the brown foliage also allows it the fuel for woodland burns. That's why pen sedge is so good for burning in woodland areas because of the brown, the foliage browns in starting in about mid to late August. But artistically wise, it really creates a nice contrast to the other, the other sedges in the planting. There's a granularis is tinted blue, you see a little bit of blue. And also interplanted with this is it's a Eurebia now, it's, it's Aster macrophyllus. It's a beautiful aster that spreads by runners. It's kind of very, it's very important for me because it fills in open spots. When it spreads by runners, it goes in all directions seeking an opportunity to come up somewhere. So it'll hit the, it'll hit the crown of a sedge and stop. So it won't, it won't, it won't take over the sedges. It'll hit the crown and stop and go another direction. So it's fine, really cool. And that's Aster macrophyllus. And, and sometimes it's a blue white, flower, more white sometimes than blue, sometimes areas it's more blue than white. And then the sol solid seal, the polygonatum commutatum comes up through anything. It, it really, it really uh, did well. It, it survived a lot of human disturbance because you can, the rise was they're cut up with a shovel or whatever piece of equipment people are digging with. It breaks it up and it'll keep coming back. It's like May apples are that way too. They take a lot of human disturbance because you can just to chop them into pieces and they'll, they'll, they'll find a, butt, a, dor a dormant bud and come up. And we and you incorporate a lot of wild geraniums and the wild geraniums find a home too. They seed freely. So once you get wild geraniums going, uh, you know, you can scatter them in and you'll, you'll see them be opportunistic and come up in little holes and gaps within the sedge community. And the sedge you see in bloom, that's Carrick Spring Yellow. You can see the beautiful way it arches uh, over when it blooms. But you don't want to put too many in because it, it opens up in the spirit. When it's unflowering, it flops open. And then it sends up beautiful vegetative growth about three weeks later and fills its own center. But some people get impatient with it. And they say, well, look at that. It's, it's so messy. I said, well, how do you look when you get out of the shower? You know, are you, are you the most beautiful person in the world? When you look at a full-length mirror, you got to get dressed. You got to put on your other stuff. You got, you know... Every living thing isn't perfect. And it also has to do a lot, like I mentioned before, with placement. You can place these so other plants can support them and not let them be floppy. So there's other, uh, like the wild geranium can hold a uh, Carrick spring yellow. So it, it's coming to know the plants. I think really before uh, you, do, you get into too much design, it's, you have to know the plants. You have to understand who they are and how they live. And most of you have grown all these, so you really know their, their habits of growth, growth rate, growth habit. It's just taking the time to, to be more considerate of composition, I think. I go back to the Shedd Aquarium. I just like, I like this view. I put this in, I had one earlier, but I love the way the sedges intermingle. Now look at how early in the spring they're green. So it's a living mulch, a green living mulch. It, it, it's textural and it's, and it's not unattractive to almost everybody. So most everybody who really has never gardened before, they find this to be beautiful. And that's a way to start people getting involved in native plants. It's not telling them how bad something is. It's, it's showing them how good something can be. 
I know a lot of people don't like to hear that they shouldn't have a lawn because they don't know what else to do. And the more they're told not to have a lawn, the more they're going to keep it. But when we can have models, every city should have a model, Oak Park, Berwyn, LaGrange, have a model of what a native community can look like. So first you have, before you, before you attract an insect or a bird, you better attract people. Because if you don't attract people, they're not going to plant it. And then once you attract people to it, all the birds, insects, pollinators, they'll start to show up based on, not, not just based on the plant you have, but based on the soil you're developing. I learned that from Jerry Wilhelm too, that it's not about the food system, the birds and insects eat, it's about the living conditions, the soil temperature, the insects that live in the soil, the building material for insect. He was mentioning to me that at the Morton Arboretum, it's gonna take about 150 years to build prairie soil. So a lot of insects that might be there, people would assume are there, aren't there because their soils aren't prairie soils yet. They're still disturbed uh, soils from agriculture. And, and that's just the way things work. You can't get what something was quickly back, but you can enjoy the ride. I think that's the key thing. It doesn't mean you have to have everything right away. You can enjoy the, the ride to get there and encourage it. So I, I just wanna go through and show you more possibilities for it's all about opportunities and possibilities and then taking an action and workability. Workability is a big thing. You can't just design something. If there's no workability to it, it won't be cared for and loved. Yeah, you have to have, once it's put in, you have to have good parents. You have to have, I call them prof gardeners, professional gardeners. Because everybody, again, in language, everyone will say they're a gardener. I know I'm a gardener, you're a gardener, he's a gardener. I could say I'm an astronaut. How many, out, how many of you out there to prove I'm not? I'm an astronaut, okay. I can believe that, but I'm not an astronaut. But when you look at a professional gardener, a gardener, a gardener that understands the relationships, how one plant will grow into the other. What's the time frame? What's the pot? What's the like right now? What what plant is going to be throwing out thousands and thousands of weed seeds in about a week? Which plant is that? They're out there. Well, that's chickweed. Chickweed's in bloom right now, and in two weeks we'll be throwing out thousands of seeds. So it's coming to know how to deal with that and how to know what the plants are growing, shaded up, and that's just really knowledge of plants and awareness of what kind of a situation they're all living in, and then. When all of you are doing that, because you do that now, you're always outside watching, observing, and, and, and participating, especially. That's when everything gets successful in a much broader way. And here, again, I use this, uh, using a living mulch to suppression instead of wood chips. There's not, weeds aren't coming through this. <laughs> there's, no, there's no weeding to do. And yet everything here is healthy. And what I encourage you to do is to create a model. Just show people in the neighborhood, show the, especially the, the aldermen and the mayor, show them the money they're spending on doing certain things that they don't need to spend money on. So it's not, it's just not, it's, it's thinking about this, it's taking an action and putting models together within a community, I think is the best way and then determine the pricing of it. Because I know a lot of people, it's all about money. And when you can cut mowing, like if you got a parking lot, you don't have to have a company up there 27 times a year to mow a parking lot. And they only show up two or three times. That's saving money and it can look beautiful and have more diversity in it too. So, and all of this can happen because the number of plants available now is phenomenal. We've never had as many plants available for, for planting as we've had now. We're in the most transformational time in horticulture we've ever seen about availability of plants. And I love this big, this is Carrick's Pennsylvania in bloom. It's like a, a feel of yellow Q-tips when you lay down there and you look at it from ground level and it just knits together. And uh, I know Tom uh, Vanderpool back in 1987 in Lake County Forest Preserve, when I was at Natural Garden, they bought I don't know, two or 3,000 Carrick's Pennsylvania from us in two, two and a half inch pots. And they planted it at one of the forest preserves on four foot centers. So I think, wow, four foot centers, that, that's far apart. And they took care of them for one year, made sure they were watered and you know, kept, 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 got them off to a good start, I would say, for one year. And then that was it. And you know what? 25 years later, it's all Carrick's Pennsylvania. And I go, God, is that cool? Because that forest preserve will be there for, how I many five, so, who have forever. It's not going anywhere. But yet, if you tell this to a person, most I don't have 25 years. I, I, you know, I, I got to get going. I, 
It's not about us or what we have. Again, it's the ride you're on. That ride to get that in the ground and at least get momentum going for the future generations that are going to be enhancing and moving forward with what you've done. It, it's one big, thick, Carrick's Pennsylvania. And to me, it, it's amazing. It only took 25 years to knit together. And that's because Carrick's Pennsylvania has the capabilities of collecting light, weaving around even the weeds that were there could, couldn't cut off enough light energy. And I'm sure somebody did go back and maybe string trimmed it, you know, a few or four or five times during its during the history of it. But those are things we need to consider, especially putting in plants that have that kind of durability. <coughs> and this, this is a, a these are again plantings I'm doing in Lake Geneva. This is a Carex bromoides, Carex albicans, around uh, uh, Cephalanthus occidentalis, the the bush and uh, Calicanthus uh, florigilis. I can't even, I don't know the common name for those, but it's beautiful red flowers. Uh, and we're just putting all uh, sedges in with everything. And, and, and again, we reduce, we reduce, I call it labor. I don't, I don't want to be the laborer in the garden. I want to be the gardener in the garden or the artist in the garden. I just don't, I want to spend my time weeding or wood chipping and it does, it doesn't make, it's not a practical approach to managing open space. So this is a this is Carex bromoides. Carex bromoides is a great plant for moist woods. So if you have wet soil, it's that average to moist soil. Carex bromoides is wonderful, and it's nice to use initially because it doesn't split in the center. It keeps a tight center, so it doesn't open up in the center. So from average to moist, this is a great sedge to use and you can mix in a little bit of Carex springella I mentioned earlier that'll be taller with an arching flower and if you go from dry or average to dry then use Carex pennsylvanica Carex albans and then Carex blanda can go either way it can go into wet and into dry so you have something to carry a dark green from one community to the next and that's that's what makes something beautiful is when you can extend uh you don't have a choppy community. It becomes this or that. The land that can offer uh, in dry to moist, to moist soil, it can go into both, both situations. That's very helpful. You can see we, we plant run all right as close as we get to the tree. We just drill, we, we drill everything in with a three inch drill bit. We just touch the soil about two, three inches deep and then we put the plugs right in, keep them watered. <coughs> and uh, once they establish, it's pretty much done, except we do have occasional weeding we go through, but it's not, it's not, it's not tiresome. And we use a Dutch push pull hole. This is Carex grissy, it's similar to Carex blanda, but it has beautiful, uh, rich green foliage. So does blanda. Well, Carex grissy is more a floodplain sedge. So if you have flooding in the spring, you can put Carex grissy in there, it can sit underwater for you know, a few days. And then when the water recedes, it'll live through that actually. Sometimes it's probably beneficial for that kind of flooding because that's how it's evolved in a floodplain situation. But it's very nice sedge with dark green, dark green foliage. Gets around 18 inches high, 12 to 18 inches high. And this is Car this is Carrick's uh, Rissi underneath the hydrangeas here at Northwind. And it, again, it's just a, it's just a cut down on labor, and it's a it's beautiful. This would look out of place if it was shredded bark or, or wood, it just wouldn't look right. And then we have to keep taking off and putting new fresh wood on. It's just nice to have the living mulch, the sedges there. Well, if you look sideways at, this is the home we did, we, we mixed uh, Carex albicans. You can see it's, I'm sorry, it's sideways with this champ CSS Matosa in a wetland area. And then we have ferns mixed in. Now, if you do tilt your head a little bit, I'm sorry it went uh, sideways when I put it in the PowerPoint, but it's a simple planting of sedges and ferns. And uh, this Champsia is a little farther down. It, it loves moist soil. This Champsia cespitosa, it grows in, where you have springs. I, uh, I've never seen it in a uh, native situation, but I like to use a lot moist in moist soil, average to moist soil. And this is Carrick's uh, Aurea. I think this is, or no, no, sorry. This is a uh, radiata, Carrick's radiata. Nice texture. 
uh, easy to grow, but then in time that it'll open up in the center as the flowers mature around early June or mid May, it kind of opens up in the center a little bit. And uh, can, it, it just looks like a deer slept on it or something. And then I said two or three weeks, it'll fill that center very efficiently. This is a Keurig's Bromoides. I did a courtyard at the Art Institute. We just got rid of all the wood mulch and they kept their hostas. We moved some around. So we didn't have to throw anything out or, or buy in anything and just really put Keurig's Bromoides in place of wood mulch. And they're done. They don't, there's no more mulching ever again um, on, on this particular site. So they were, you know, they were thrown. They like to look too. They like the soft texture. There's a picture I showed you earlier. This is Carrick's Antigenia at the bottom. The Carrick's albicans and Carrick at the top is Carrick's Mesquinumensis. It's palm sedge that grows in moist areas. But you can change. That's what you see the textural changes here. And that's what I like. I, I, I like to create textural changes and, and get more composition involved with the, the wide leaf on the bottom, the soft textured leaf, and then the, the horizontal branching of the Carex muscingomensis on top. And it's a much taller plant too. And that's Carex bromoides on a sloping garden. And this was a simple garden again for a residential. We used, a, she liked yellow. So we put in ladies mantle, alcamella and just drifted on the, the medium side. We just drifted Carex bromoides all through there and Carex spring yellow up above. And this is a Carex albicans with a, Jacob's ladder, pomonium reptans, and some spring green tulips mixed in. So it's a, a simple planting, uh, more geared towards uh, May, mid May, late May. But uh, aren't the sedges beautiful fillers? The texture is just so nice. I want to go back to it because a lot of people start the other way. They'll put in the pomonium reptans. And then they'll just put mulch around the pulmonium reptans. The pulmonium, pulmonium reptans seeds around freely, but then there's always that uh, mulch layer in between the pulmonium reptans. That's where I think the sedges, one, it's a texture so beautiful, and two, we, that's how we can minimize that yearly use of wood. Here's one of my favorite sedges architecturally, it's Carex shortiana. See, the, the flowers turn that dark green, dark brown, then go to black. It's and it stays upright. It's a beautiful sedge. That means it maintains its upright appearance and has a heavier leaf. So this is architecturally a stunning plant. Carex, uh, Carex shortiana. And this is a Carex polita. Carex polita is super for that mid-range rain garden. It's in that middle area where sometimes engineers don't really know how much water is going after one inch rain, how much water will get into the rain garden or how long the water will be there. So that mid area is always the place that declines quickly because the water usually stays longer than people would anticipate. Well, Carex polita will take water for a long period of time. And then when the water drains away, if it becomes dry in July and August, the Carex polita will maintain a beautiful green color. It does spread aggressively, but in those mid range areas, it's, it's very beneficial. And it looks like somebody combed it. It always leans the same direction. So it has a, very engaging look when, when it's uh, matured. It, it just looks like every morning somebody brushes it one direction or another. So it's a very, but it, the durability and functionality of it in rain gardens is, is to me critical. I use that at Cantini a lot because they have, they had very fluctuating water. Like they could control their water level too. They had a valve they could open to let the water out if they got to it. But this one, it was a, a good workhorse sedge for water that stayed longer than anticipated. That's a palm sedge I showed you earlier, Carex muscingumensis. That's for moist areas too, moist to dry. These were the gardens I redid at Ball using uh, Eucharas, Hecana Chloe, but you see the sedges all, all through there. Then we use Carex albicans to tie everything together. It goes through the. So, um, it's becoming, I'd say, normal. Where we, again, where we can use sedge, it becomes a normal ground cover. 10 years ago, nobody even heard of what's a Carex, what do they do? So we're getting more and more people now that understand who they are, how they live, and who they can live with. And sedges aren't bashful. It's not that, that they want to, they can only live with one group of plants or another. 
they, they don't mind living with the Eucharist they, and they don't mind you know, living with the Hakuna Chloe that's native to Japan. And the one thing about the Hakuna Chloe, it doesn't seed, it's sterile, but it does create an opportunity for the sedges to shine and other plants, native plants to be mixed in to, to shine with them. So when they all shine together, they're more wanted and, and enjoyed by more people, the more they get used and put into our landscapes. And I just thought I'd show you this. This is where we, we mow the gardens. This is Fontana, the boulevards in Fontana. We got 18,000 square feet of boulevards. And the plantings there, it would take about uh, nine hours per thousand, eight to nine hours per thousand square feet to clean it, cut it, haul it away in a truck, and another eight hours to bring back shredded bark. So that's probably 16 hours per thousand square feet. The DPW, they, they mow the boulevards all 18,000 square feet. They do it in six hours, they're done. And every plant there lives in its own leaf fall and stem fall as their ancestors did. And our plants are all healthy. So when you look at how much uh, money we've saved the community, I go, you know, if you look at 15 hours, 17 times 15 times $50 an hour, and now they don't bill that out to anybody, they mow it themselves with their own staff. So these are the kind of things we look for. It's not to create aesthetics. We want aesthetics. We want healthy. We want, we want to, and when we show affordability, we can see how putting plants together in smart systems can create affordability and then cre can create something beautiful and it creates something we do more of in every community. So these are the sedge planting. We just leave the leaves. We don't rake up the leaves. We don't haul the leaves away. Everything gets mowed in the spring. And everything gets ground up. We use mulching mowers. We have a blade on a walk behind mulching mower and we just go over it five or six times and then we're done. And that's what it looks like after we mow it in the spring. We, you can see all the stem fall and leaf falls laying in the garden and the sedges will come up with new growth. They'll bloom in uh, late April and May and they'll cover the earth, keep the slight down from hitting soil and keep and minimize weed competition. So it's a good way for us to get rid of gar garlic mustard we just don't let it get light to Germany. And you can see this is a Hugo culture community. I don't know if you know what Hugo culture is. This was uh, in Chanticleer. Uh, the gardener in the woods is, is taking Hugo culture. He's just taking all the debris that exists in his woods and he's building these mounds out of sticks and fallen trees. Then he covers it with all the leaves He rakes up leaves and any weeding he does, he puts on top of these mounds and he covers it with an inch of earth and look at how beautiful he plants them in sedges. And I think, uh, what else has he got there? I can't see if it's wooden enemies. Yeah, it looks like wooden enemies in there. And he's got uh, swamp sacks of fridge down here with cinnamon ferns. And the idea he's doing is just to move water through there at a, at, at a, at a way he'd like to see the water move through the woodland area. He's a very bright guy. And there's so many parks that we could do this with and then have have this done with people within the community. I think it, I think it'd be great to get the community involved in because I, I, I don't think the park districts now are going to be affording, they're not going to be able to afford doing all this on their own. So what we look at, you know, we have, we, like in Sweden, uh, in, I think Sweden and Norway, all their parks are maintained by the people that live in the community. The park districts pick in, pick up and pitch in but the guards are maintained by people that live within the community around all the parks. I, I think that's a, something we have to, to look at. And I know we're, we're doing that where I live in Lawndale on Rose, uh, I'm off of uh, Douglas Boulevard. I put, we, the city put in guards on 16th Street and my wife is working with youth and Pastor Roshona to train youth to become gardeners. So we're taking care of all the new uh, parks they're basically there to mitigate water that was standing in the streets. So we'll be working with, she'll be working with young people and showing them the opportunities to become gardeners. And when they learn to become gardeners, identify some of the plants and understand how to hoe and, and weed around the plants, they'll realize they're just not people pushing a hole, but they're young people that can get hired maybe by Christy Weber and other landscape contractors who need gardeners instead of just landscapers. There's nothing wrong with landscapers. We need landscapers because we do want to keep the earth neat and tidy. I mean, without landscapers, uh, no, they do that, but they're not gardeners. They don't know how to maintain gardens. And we need that. We need all the things you're doing out there, all the things happening in your backyard is happening because you're a gardener. 
not because you're a landscape. And that's the future we're moving into, the inevitable future. We are, we are going into a plant-driven future. We're not, it's not weed, wood, chip, and replace, weed, wood, chip, and replace. It's, it's all about how we can use plants in healthy and, and smart ways. And then we look at the value of water. I mean, everyone's complaining about gas prices. And I understand that because I complain too, I'm human. But I just do that because everybody else does. I grew up complaining about gas prices. I was so upset when I was paying 26 cents a gallon in 1973 on my Volkswagen. I don't want to pay 45 cents a gallon. I was only getting a dollar 68 bag and yet jewel. Why would I want to pay more? But it's just how we're trained to think. You know, when you look at what's the value of the, it's water. You know, what do, how, where are we gonna, how are we going to manage and how are we going to maintain clean water? And again, that's all doable because it's just putting plants in the earth, letting the earth plants or systems go deeper in the soil, minimize runoff and clean the waters that filters back into the earth. So again, it's all about this plant driven future that we're all part of. And you can see with the, the rainstorms falling on our cornfields and large areas of turf, they're not, they don't quite have the root systems that penetrate deep enough to handle that water going to the earth that quickly. And that's why if we, you know, get parkland that we're mowing that we don't need to mow. Like here in Fontana, when all the community went out and took a whole area that used to get mowed every year, you know, 15, 20 times a year, it's a prairie. So I think if we start with the big areas that park districts don't want to mow as a community, go out there and put prairies in, then people will see that homeowner and say, can I do that at my house? So it start big, you know, go, I'm sure there's a lot of park districts. I know when I worked at the St. Charles Park District, I was mowing areas back in the mid seventies. I didn't, that's all I, that's all I did was mow them for no reason because there was no, nothing else we could do. And then we have to engineer sites better so plants can live. Nothing's going to live here. So engineers have to pick up the pace and they have to not just put standardized curbs and eight inches of the soil and put a shrub in and a bunch of dailies that's going to pass away and die. What we need to do is look at how do you connect the soil above to the soil below. And when you connect the soil above to the soil below, you have the movement of water up and down and up, down, up, up into the root zone and down from rainfall down into the water table. So these typical engineering sites just, just are just not the future either. And these are changing. I mean, we're, we're doing more and more. I'm working with some groups that are doing more and more work getting rid of these gravel layers that really aren't any benefit to plants living at all. We will not live in that. And when you see areas like this where the wrong plants were chosen uh, to, to create this, to, to put in there, the area got too wet. And the plants that were in there just weren't capable of living because of the, the, wet, the wet soil. And that's when people work off of lists, sitting in an office. They're handing plants that live in wet soil, plants that live in dry soil, plants that live in part shade. You can't, that's like science fiction writing. When you're designing something from an office, if, if you're just working off a list, that's like a science fiction garden. It's never gonna live. You have to live within that world of plants to understand who they are and how they live before you can create something. You can't do it working off of lists. How long does it stay wet? Two weeks, three weeks, all the way into the summer? You know, how, long, how long, when the foliage is architectural, when does it become architectural? When is the size recognized as architectural? Who's it shading out as it grows and matures? There's so many questions. And then we end up with conditions like this, you know, like this. And you look at the guys that made it, those are asters along the edge. So some of the plants actually did pretty good you know, with the hit or miss system. And then we look at uh, you know plantings. This is plantings done in uh, West Union, Wisconsin, where we we've actually this is a place where the soil is connected to the soil below. There's no irrigation systems here. It's uh, the plants live on average rainfall with some supplemental watering by the city. They bought a watering truck in case they had water. They didn't want to put irrigation systems in. And this is what they had simply by connecting earth to earth and not putting in that gravel layer. And a lot of these, I was so impressed, you know, who maintains all these, it's not the city, it's the shop owners. They realize because not, the gardens are enhancing the entrance ways to their stores and offices. So the people that live and have stores in West Union, Iowa, actually take care of all the planters because it makes their store look better. 
I, I left out saying this, this is so good. And then to enhance certain spillways where plants come in as a garden, we did, we put sedges in the gravel. You see the water poured through here and the water came down a road there and just went right through there like gangbusters. So where you added sedges, the sedges are maturing and spreading through the gravel. And it kind of softens that, that runoff area. And this is the, the sedge garden. Uh, I did a cantini. It's worked, I think it's worked out well. And the, the time now is they can add, they can add color if they want to. You know, like the little abelias in there, you could, you could just enhance it with more entertainment, I would say, if, if they wanted to. And then working with youth. These are grasses and sedge gardens we did for uh, schools in the city of Chicago for outdoor outdoor classrooms. And we laid out, that's Carrick's Pennsylvania, all the sense from even between the street and the sidewalk, putting Carrick's Pennsylvania. So these are models, and it's a great working with youth because then they get an early understanding of the importance and value of plants. And with the outdoor classroom, it's all explained by teachers. The teachers interact with the kids. Here's why we're doing this. Here's what this, this group of plants is going to do. And this, again, planting sedges between the curb and the sidewalk that you don't have to mow every every week. You just put a sedge matrix in. You can put bulbs in here if you want. Or you can say, you know what? The sedges look good enough. We're happy with the sedges. You can put dodecathion in there. You want to incorporate wild geranium. You can do a lot of things if you want. Or you can do nothing. And just take the mowing money and put it into something else that uh, you could, the city could use to, to make something more beautiful somewhere else. And then we look at water-wise gardens. I just did a garden at Argonne National Laboratory around the world's biggest computer building. Because now Argonne, what do you think is in the world's biggest computer building? The world's biggest computer. And we did 12,000 square feet of gravel gardens. And simply, what is a gravel garden? You can look it up online. You go to Cassie and Schmidt. I saw, I saw this in Germany in 2008, and I did one here immediately as soon as I got back to the United States. You put down five inches of gravel, quartzite chips we were using, and how many weeds can push through five inches of quartzite gravel? No, nothing. And you plant in the gravel and the plants will root into the soil below and you've created, a, you've changed the habitat. So the plants will flourish and grow. You can't ever change it because you'll bring soil into the gravel. But look how beautiful that is. This is a garden I did at Old Brook Botanic Garden. That's the staff at Old Brook. This was uh, oh, 2008, no. I'm sorry, 2016, 2015. That's the garden today. It's all natives. Prufsky, well, I have to cheat. I put Prufsky in. I needed that vertical blue, but look how beautiful that looks. You know what they do there? Nothing. They have to clean it well. You have to cut everything back and remove all the plant, the, the plant debris, the plant stem fall and leaf fall, because you can't let it build up uh, organic matter. The weed seeds will come in. But you can take that and move it somewhere else and mow it up and just scatter through a garden. But these things are just valuable things. This could be a parking lot in Oak Park where you could have this beautiful look in Oak Park and you visit it once a year. There's nothing to do. So I think this the building in Argonne is going to be good for people to see the, the opportunity of, of putting plants in gravel. And you know, I mean, it doesn't mean you do this everywhere, but there's particular spots where you want something to look beautiful and healthy, and you can have insects, pollinators, birds showing up. You could even go there and have a family picnic in a parking lot because it looks so beautiful. But your cost can go, be cut by three quarters of what it's charged to just go out there and mow it. So um, when we see land as a community to which we belong, we may begin to use it with love and respect. And that's all the Leopold. And he's actually one that when I think about being a goofball from Berwyn, and all I thought about was bas basketball and baseball. And I had great friends, too, in Berwyn. When I read si Sand County Almanac when I got to Western Illinois in 1972, that changed my world, reading that Sand County Almanac. So I really have oh, a lot to older Leopold. I never met him. You know, he was dead long before I was even born. But just reading that book changed my perspective of how I view things. Because it's, it's really all how, how we bring something into our life and how we create opportunities for it. And I always keep asking myself, you know, what is my future asking from me? And I, I always have to keep finding out what is that future asking from me so I can move in that direction with who I've become and what. Well. So I would ask all of you, what is your future asking from you? You know, what direction? I mean, you love native plants, you love native communities. And I think if, if you know, whatever you 